So, uh, dear colleagues, friends, uh, I wish you all a very welcome to this Sustainability Day for faculty and staff at our school. Uh, this is a reoccurring arena for forward-looking collegiate discussion on the development of the school's high ambitions to answer to our responsibility when it comes to tackling society's sustainability challenges. Now, sustainability is a very wide concept. And uh, sometimes, and I would say increasingly, it's used in such a general or generic meaning that it loses specific or normative content. So we have to be careful in using this concept and being aware of that it could lead anyway. And we should also be aware of the meaning that we accrue to the, con uh, to the concept. When starting the integration of sustainability perspectives into our educational operations in 2012, we took a base point in the Brundtland report, Our Common Future, which is a report from 1987. Uh, the Brundtland report very wisely established a wide concept of sustainability, including economic, social and ecologic sustainability, and thereby creating some kind of concept which was all encompassing when it comes to social activities in society. This was discussed over the years, and but it's first with through the Agenda 2030 that was amended, uh, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2015, that we got a more concise, precise definition of the concept of sustainability. And uh, if we look at the Agenda 2030, it's seemingly clear at a first glance. It's a plan, a layout for creating sustainability, a sustainability for our societies, for their future development. And this in a relatively short period of time. And right now there are only seven years left. But uh, if we look a little bit closer at Agenda 2030, it's full of inconsistencies, internal tensions, and uh, it has nevertheless a very good pedagogic meaning. All in bright colors. But it's not a canonic text, and it should not be. And it's clear that any academic approach to sustainability must include a critical assessment of the concept against the backdrop of new knowledge, new experiences. It has to be reformulated, developed, calibrated to our present situation. And um, that is I would say a core of the discussions that we will have today and a special one special focus today relates to a central truly global sustainability challenge that is of fundamental existential character the irreversible depletion of biodiversity it is a challenge that is closely linked to climate change it's given, I would say, rapidly increasing attention in public debate. And uh, it was given a great deal of attention after the COP15 in Montreal, which was recently concluded with the adoption of the Global Biodiversity Framework. It, all, it is also reflected in research activities at our school such as the participation in the research program Biopath, financed by Mistra, with the objective to find pathways for an efficient alignment of the financial system with the needs of biodiversity. So with that said, I will hand over to Marie, and she will set off the journey of today. Thank you very much and welcome.
Many thanks, Per. Uh, I'm very happy to share this first seminar, and I'm very honored to also introduce to you Professor Unai Pascual, Iker Bask Research Professor at the Basque Center for Climate Change, BC3 in short. And Professor Pascual, he's the leading economic expert in the work of IPES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform <coughs> for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And I have had a great privilege to interact <coughs> and collaborate with P Professor Pascal uh, during a number of years in IPES. So I'm very glad that he attends my own school here. But besides and before IPES, uh, Professor Pascal was and is uh, internationally well known for his research on the ecological economic relationships between human nature uh, and human well-being, uh, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and climate change. And he also has a numerous num uh, and influential engagements on the global level, uh, besides it, so you could say. Anyway, the most recent imprint Professor Pascal has made, uh, uh, and that is connected to then the val IPES values assessment that he will be presenting today, which is influenced, of course, of Professor Pascal's thinking. Uh, that is that this assessment that came earlier this summer uh, clearly has mar made its mark in the global biodiversity framework the pair mentioned. Uh, that now was decided before Christmas in Montreal and will is for they, that sake likely kind of have an influence on how the world globally assess and work with biodiversity in the future. You can say that this global biodiversity framework is kind of a Paris agreement for biodiversity. I make this short on Professor Pascal. There must be more to be said, but I'm eager to listen to this presentation. So by that, I just say welcome virtually to Gothenburg, Unai, and please, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you very much, Marie. Um, I'm very flattered for, for your words. I'm, I'm sad that I'm, I cannot share this day, this important day for the faculty with you. Uh, so apologies for, for just you having to sit there and, and, and watch at the screen. Uh, we know that it's not the best, but sometimes we can make it work. Hopefully we can make it work today. Uh, I just gave a, a seminar to your, your colleagues at the Department of Economics. Um, so, so now, now it's, it's the turn to maybe broaden a little bit more the scope of, of the presentation that I gave a few minutes ago. And um, as uh, Marie mentioned, um, and, and, and the previous speaker mentioned as well, well, well quite, quite nicely, uh, the words of sustainability, the concept of sustainability, development, but even words like resilience or transformation, and they are, they are very contested. And, and it's, it's very, very logical. Why. Why. Uh, first, first, because we all hold normative, normative positions, and we, we, we try, try to, to bring those, those concepts, concepts that are young, young uh, or, or the, the uh, intellectual, intellectual battlefields, so to say, say in, a, in way a way that can, can align with our views, views with our goals, goals and with our interests. But, but we, we know, know that um, everybody, everybody does, does that, it's not, not only us, yes, everyone, everyone does, does it. Even, Even in academia, academia we, do we do it every, every day, all, all the time. time. We, we try, try to interpret concepts, concepts use them, them in a in way, way that, that fit, fit with, with our framings. And, and, and every, every now and then, then only every now and then, then some of these concepts break down and we are able to constructively engage in producing or reinterpreting a concept so that the concept has more power, more leverage, uh, especially to, um, to make change really happen. Uh, the kind of change that we think that we share ideas of, of uh, that we share. Uh, we know that biodiversity is, is in, um, in a very dangerous downward sloping process. Uh, as the first speaker mentioned, this is uh, an irreversible issue. Uh, we are losing so much, even without complete knowledge about what we are losing, but our, uh, we have sufficient intuition. And I would say more than 
what more than a lot of knowledge, at least more than what we would need to really understand that we have to put a stop to biodiversity loss. Hopefully, the global biodiversity framework by the CBD will be a cornerstone. Hopefully, it will be the kind of Paris Agreement for biodiversity, as Marie mentioned. Uh, it is yet to be seen uh, how we we engage with with that framework and and in which ways we can use it. Uh, to leverage real change. I cannot see my presentation. I cannot share it, but I know, oh, here it is. I can. So I'm going to ask to pass the slides one by one uh, as I maybe I, I will be um, able to scroll faster than I hoped first to, to have a, a dialogue with, with all of you. Uh, so please, could we just start uh, moving the presentation. Um, the values assessment of FIDBES, which was uh, presented to plenary to about 140 countries and was approved in, in July, basically derives directly from uh, the mandate or the demand from these countries um, in a way that follows quite nicely from the very influential global assessment of FIDBES, which was released a few years before. Uh, in that global assessment, <clears throat> uh, one of the chapters, but I guess it, uh, this was articulated very nicely throughout the su its summary for policymakers, it was very clear that there are cer certain concepts and ideas that need to be incorporated into uh, the uh, science policy interface around biodiversity or nature more, more broadly. One has to do uh, with the idea of justice and equity, another, which is again uh, a very socially driven concept, uh, and another one is values. I mean, the idea of unleashing sustainability aligned values or unleashing positive values that can lead us to a better future, a future that is more sustainable. And I will put double quotes on the sustainability because I think this is going to be the theme of the discussion, how we interpret and make sense of this of this concept throughout your day today. And uh, so more just and more sustainable. Uh, so that's that's the objective of the of IBES in a in a broad way with biodiversity at its core. Yeah. So please let's uh, let's move on to the next one. Can we uh, pass the slide, please. So <clears throat> I'm not going to step to stop here, but I mean the UN uh, different UN programs like UNEP uh, or the UNDP uh, or organization like FAO and so on. They have all praised the values assessment, um, and they all hope that this will potentially contribute uh, to. Um, knowing how to navigate or how to start leverage leverage and change yeah in that direction that we we just articulated uh, slightly uh, broadly uh, let's next one please <clears throat> so IBES, like the IPCC every every few years they uh, they release um, what they what we hope will be influential reports made by many people um, uh, in this case for the values assessment for the uh, what is called the the assessment report on the diverse values and valuation of nature was carried out by almost 100 core um, uh, contributors nominated by by uh, countries uh, officially so it's following the the official process, plus another about 200 experts that contributed in an ad hoc way to very specific parts of the assessment where those 100 experts did not have the capacity of the manpower or, or the enough knowledge to contribute uh, with specific reviews of the evidence. Um, so in total, ab about 39 different types of literature reviews were undertaken on many different topics related directly related to values and valuation of nature this implied uh, reviewing more than 50,000 documents uh, and as you know um, 
these reports are open for comments uh, various times throughout the, uh, the development of the, of the reports. Uh, so we received uh, about or more than 7,000 uh, expert comments or comments from practitioners or comments from academics and, and those comments were all addressed in the report and these types of comments always of course enrich uh, the reports in many different ways. We also uh, had contributions from uh, 25 indigenous local knowledge holders and experts which is something that IPES really cares about because as we know the main wealth of biodiversity remains in the territories of indigenous uh, communities or uh, local communities and their perspectives, their says, their needs, their knowledge, uh, which sometimes uh, can be nicely bridged with scientific knowledge, some other times is, is much more difficult, but we try to bridge uh, those different types of knowledge into, into our report um, as well. Next one, please. So <clears throat> uh, here you have a QR if you have your mobile phones handy and, and there you can, uh, you can get uh, the main summary for policymakers of the, of the assessment, uh, which is about a 30 page document more or less, that states uh, like 10 main uh, messages that are then broken down into smaller messages which back up those 10 messages and they can guide you to the a specific place in the full report in those six different chapters where the evidence is stated uh, with specific levels of confidence about uh, the reliability of, of many of the statements that uh, come into the summary for policymakers. In our case, we were uh, quite lucky in the sense that the great majority of the statements and messages that were brought into the summary are very well established in the literature so we are quite confident that uh, what the material that is in the in the summary uh, and in the report itself uh, covers uh, uh, important topics about values and valuation that could directly be uh, brought into decision making processes both in, uh, in the public realm but also in, uh, in in the private sector and, and other sectors uh, next one please so to, um, to start with the, with the main kind of message is a very intuitive one, but one that has to be said. We know that the way nature is valued is one of the main drivers of the global biodiversity crisis, but it is also an opportunity to address it. Okay, so here we start um, bringing the, concept, uh, well, the idea of value into the crisis. Okay, so we are made of values, we are made of flesh, but we are made of values, our normative position, our, the way we interpret the world, we, the way we interpret the problems or the solutions have to do with our value systems, our knowledge system, which is also related to values. So this creates something of a difficult animal uh, because we have to reflect our own specific values when we, uh, we produce this type of, of, um, of report. Okay, so as academics, we do also have our value systems in place. The different academic perspectives or disciplines do rely on some embedded values or normative positions. Sometimes they are very hidden. Uh, sometimes, uh, especially social scientists, are more open to discuss about them. So this is something that we also had to play with. Uh, next one, please. So the outline for today's presentation, I'm going to try to go quite fast, um, uh, just give glimpses uh, of, of the full uh, report. First is to start thinking about how do people value nature? Uh, the second one is how we can make those values uh, of nature visible, especially for decision making. How can we integrate those values into decisions when they are made visible? Um, and fourthly, how we can develop uh, new paradigms of progress or human well-being or human nature relationships aligned with sustainability and justice that embed uh, values or shifts in values. And lastly, um, there is a whole chapter, the last chapter, which is kind of the, the more practical one, the one which basically sets the, the, the scene about Okay, so what can we do about all this? I mean, now that we have reviewed all this literature, 
how can we move forward? I mean, how can we engage with different sectors? I mean, from education, the media, the private sector, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, to to try to bring all this this wealth of knowledge and and about the role of values into some kind of action. Yeah. Uh, so that's that will be the last chapter of the uh, of the report, and we might have a bit of time to to discuss about that maybe in the dialogue in the question and answer session. Next one, please. So next one. So how, how do people value nature? So we know that over many centuries, even millennia, uh, people have developed many distinct ways of connecting and even understanding nature. And this has led to a huge diversity of ways of how different people value nature uh, and the contributions or the benefits or the burdens or the costs that uh, nature can uh, create. I mean, let's not be naive. Uh, we interpret the concept of nature and we know that nature is a socially constructed um, concept, as all concepts are, of course. Um, some people might benefit from certain facets of nature and that same facet of nature might imply a negative burden or cost on some other person. So and that's why here economists are so important as well, because they can weigh and trade off costs and benefits sometimes in monetary units, but sometimes not necessarily in economic uh, units. Other disciplines can, can try to see the trade-offs in um, explaining in different ways. Okay, but uh, uh, most of the, of the uh, role of biodiversity as we see is positive, even if we know that in very localized situations, we also need to understand that there are distributional issues in the benefits and costs in managing biodiversity in different ways. Next one, please. So, <clears throat> next one, please. So, the, one of the first things that the whole report does is try to engage with a very difficult topic, which is how we interpret the concept of values. Um, I cannot see you in the in the um, in the audience, but if I if I were there, I would ask you to raise your hands about how you would interpret value the concept of value um, in in ways that mm, align with your very intuitive perspective as well as with your disciplinary perspective. So if we ask an economist about value, it is very likely that they will, first thing they will say is about, oh, this is about human preferences, how people uh, express their preferences about the importance of things, specific things about nature, not nature in general, but very specific aspects about nature, how they, those using or managing or, or making use of those uh, facets of nature can increase or affect their well-being uh, or their welfare, or their income, or the consumption opportunities in some ways, yeah, or 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 production uh, opportunities. If we are talking about nature as inputs into into production processes, but of course, if we talk to a geographer, or if we talk to a I don't know an anthropologist or a philosopher, the way they would engage with this question about what do we mean by value is going to be very different sometimes. There could be areas of agreement, and sometimes there will be areas of huge disagreements. And I guess this is why its discipline engages with uh, debates about the values of nature in their own way. And we see uh, less interaction than what we wished for, but the values assessment has provided um, a launch pad in a way for that kind of interaction to, to be fostered. Uh, we did four years of a lot of interaction and one of those products is this typology of values. It's understanding not only the concept of values, but how we can create a conceptual map around the very different dimensions of values and how these dimensions are connected to each other. And I think academically or scientifically, this is a very powerful uh, typology, uh, but it's something that could be very practical for decision makers whenever they talk about values of nature, okay? because. Uh, they have to be very explicit about what dimensions of values they are talking about and how uh, by disregarding certain dimensions of that concept or engaging with others, what implication that would have. I think this is uh, this tool can be a very powerful tool for, for reflection. Uh, 
you can go to the summary for policymakers. You have a, a maybe you can you can read about the typology in in one in one page and, and make sense of it. I'm just going to introduce something which is very simple. When we talk about values, we need to start thinking about people's worldviews and knowledge systems because which, which are embedded in their own uh, cultural um, experience or history. Why? Because that creates what we call broad values. And the broad values in the values assessment is interpreted as the guiding principles that people have. Okay, so how, why or in which ways people think something uh, is good or bad, or in which ways uh, uh, certain behavior is good or bad, how we should guide our behavior, our actions. Okay, so we can think about, for example, on, posi on the positive side, if we talk about caring for the environment or stewardship or reciprocity uh, or unity. Uh, these are kinds of concepts that we use very implicitly in our everyday lives, but also when we set norms and rules in our societies, uh, because they set the main guiding principles for that society. And those are broad values. Okay, so those are the kinds of uh, values that we tend to talk when we are in the street or in the in the pub with our friends. Okay, we don't talk about the next layer of values, which are which is more in the realm of some more academic debates, which are specific values, which have to do with what we call uh, intrinsic values, like the values of nature for its own sake, regardless of what humans think about the benefits of nature and a lot of philosophical debates exist about how to interpret this abstract uh, concept of, of, uh, of value. Uh, we can talk about instrumental values like uh, nature as a means to an end. So, for example, nature as a means to well-being of people. Uh, so economists usually talk in this, in this way, uh, they frame the, nature, the, the values of nature in this very pragmatic and tangible way. Uh, but not only economists. I mean, most of policy making is about thinking about instrumental values. Like, oh, the, when we talk about the green economy, it's about creating jobs and, and in enhancing the uh, uh, the health of the population uh, through environmental regulations. And so, there's always the environment or nature as a means to human well-being. That's the kind of instrumental uh, nature, instrumental approach to understanding values. And there, there is another one which is uh, another domain within the specific values uh, type, which is slightly different. It's not kind of the more kind of moral aspect or the rights-based aspect of of, uh, of nature or nature for its own sake or the instrument or uh, using nature as an instrument for our own well-being, but it's something I, and I wouldn't even say in between. It's a different category. It has to do with understanding the value of nature because it. Um, we do all have meaningful relationships to nature which are not either instrumental or have to do with an intrinsic understanding of nature. For example, if we talk about our sense of place or our sense of identity um, or how we interpret also the idea of caring for people or caring for the environment, it, this is a slightly different. It's not purely instrumental, uh, it's not moral sometimes, it's somewhere uh, that connects to certain broad values um, and that type of specific value we call relational values. Okay, and this is a topic that is gaining uh, or is emerging in the, in the sustainability science uh, debates very strongly and is something that the IPES values assessment uh, portrays or, or flags very importantly uh, throughout the report and it's something that is already in the DNA of, of it best. Uh, so we're thinking about instrumental, intrinsic and relational values for, for decision making. Now, of course, each of these different types of, of, um, of, of uh, how we understand uh, values can be measured qualitatively or quantitatively in different ways. And therefore, there will be plenty of different indicators which are part of this typology of values. Can we go next, please? And uh, now I'm going to start speeding up. Next, please. I've already mentioned this. So what we know is that, uh, uh, and this is kind of a factor, it's part of the evidence that we, we bring in the, in the report, is that the majority of economic and political decisions, I'm talking about the big economic and big political decisions, predominantly 
uh, favor the market-based instrumental category of value. So when we when they understand values of nature, they are thinking about the way nature serves an end, which could be economic growth, or it could be jobs, or it could be health, it could be consumption, uh, generating income. Um, usually those instrumental values that go through the market. Okay, so many other very important instrumental values uh, that do not go through the market, usually they, uh, they get disregarded or ignored. And mostly relational and intrinsic values, they get almost completely ignored in the big, big political and economic decisions. But this is not just blaming econ uh, economic policy or other types of policies, because conservation, big conservation decisions, usually promoted by, for example, big NGOs, uh, they usually also frame the values of nature in a very narrow way. They usually tend to uh, to, to promote the, the idea of the intrinsic value of nature. So protecting species are for their own sake, sometimes disregarding how this could impact uh, uh, human nature relationships. People who live or interact with those species in those habitats, or ecosystems, etc. So there are tensions both uh, within the conservation camp and of course in the camp of political decisions. And we see that every day. Next one, please. Next one. <clears throat> so, so how can we make visible those very different ways of, of uh, understanding values of nature and uh, through different metrics and, and so on? How do we do it? Well, there is no shortage of methods. Uh, we are quite good in doing it, actually. Uh, every discipline have different methods. Uh, some disciplines do have a, a higher diversity of methods than others. But in total, we have reviewed more than 50 methods um, <clears throat> that exist to assess nature's values uh, and that have been applied in many, many different parts of the world. Next one, please. So if we use, if you just look at this map, uh, we georeferenced almost 50,000 uh, studies of valuation around the world. And we, I mean, there are many things that we could say about this map, but, but I guess the first thing that comes to our mind is is something that we would have expected, that most of the valuation studies actually take place in the global north. So the global south, uh, although is gaining into this ranking of, of conducting uh, valuation studies, it still is lagging quite behind. And if we look at the correlation between where valuation studies are being undertaken and, and the characteristics of those countries, usually what we see is that valuation usually occurs or valuation studies are undertaken where biodiversity is in greater peril. So there's a, a real political, uh, economic or social aspect around the loss of biodiversity. Uh, and also where, uh, not su surprisingly, uh, there is enough um, financial resources to, to carry out valuation studies. Because as you can imagine, valuation, st valuation studies require uh, sometimes quite a lot of investment in terms of human capacities, data, uh, monitoring, etc. If we look at where, what kinds of uh, areas, uh, ecologically speaking, valuation usually takes place, we see that at least a quarter of valuation, at least in the last decade, if we go deeper into a subsample of, of, uh, of valuation studies, because of course we could not go in depth into the 50,000, but we went in depth into more than a thousand uh, random list sampled uh, studies, set of studies. We see that many are conducted in forests, but also in, in agricultural or, or um, kind of agroforestry systems. And then uh, there is a, a diversity uh, of other types of ecological systems where, where valuation has taken place, as you can, as you can see on the slide. Uh, next one, please. So we have the same as we did a typology of valuation concepts. We have done a, a typology of methods of those more than 50 methods and we have categorized them. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but you can see this in the, in the summary for policymakers. Uh, the only thing that I would say is that this typology of valuation methods does not follow specific disciplinary perspective. It has to do with uh, the way the, uh, the information is sourced, uh, 
uh, and uh, or how the, that inf information could be generated. And, and then once we categorize these bigger families of methods, what we did is to go in depth into um, finding uh, sp uh, some critical trade-offs that can exist when we conduct specific valuation methods that I will explain very shortly. Next one, please. <clears throat> one thing that is important to, to, remain, uh, to remember is that those method families that I've just uh, highlighted are usually um, very well reflected in academic in the academic literature in the scientific literature but there are other types of methodologies that are applied by uh, local communities or indigenous people with their own rules with their own approaches uh, many times very systematically uh, they are not ad hoc they do follow their own uh, knowledge systems um, what we have tried to do also is is to bring and review some of those methodologies some of those approaches that indigenous people use uh, when they are valuing or when they are interpreting the importance of different facets of nature uh, within their own uh, cosmologies and with their own worldviews next one please so <clears throat> if you go to uh, chapter three of this report you will see um, a summary, <clears throat> a very visual summary of very different methods that can be used to value different facets of nature. And what we do here is we try to um, understand what trade-offs exist for each of the methods, each of the available methods in terms of the uh, amount of resources that are required to carry out those methods, but also how relevant those methods are to provide good information about the values that we care about and also how robust uh, those methods are in terms of providing kind of reliable information so accuracy uh, and levels of uncertainty that are associated with the application of those methods and this is something that is quite important when we are deciding which methods to use when we care about specific uh, values yeah and that's something that could be very useful not only for, for academics, but also for, for technical people in ministries or, or even the private sector, when they are thinking about carrying a valuation study and they don't know which methods to, uh, to conduct or to, um, to call for uh, by, by academics to help them uh, conducting certain valuation studies. Next one, please. So one thing that I think I heard from... Uh, <clears throat> From the first speaker uh, of the day, I think he said that there is, you have a project which has to do with participation. That's very interesting because what we've seen is that even if, if there are clear protocols or stage or phases of how to conduct uh, valuation, we have seen that only in 1% of cases, meaningful participation by stakeholders, by a diversity of stakeholders happens throughout the valuation process. So there is something that we need to improve. I mean, how to engage uh, participation in valuation. So uh, valuation, although it could be expert driven, could be uh, could engage uh, different stakeholders in different parts of the evaluation process to uh, add to the robustness or the reliability, or even through citizen science, for example, to to reduce the 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 investment needs. Uh, uh, of, of some valuation approaches. Next one. So now, how do we integrate values into decisions? Okay, that's that's another question that we are going to engage now very briefly. Uh, can we please pass to the next slide? So something that has raised the eyebrows of most people who have read this report, and even during the negotiation process of the Summary for Policymakers, is this idea that um, uh, from all the published uh, studies about valuation, only 5% of those studies engage with uh, some part of the policy cycle. Okay, so what this means is that the vast majority of valuation studies are done because we just want to add knowledge. Okay, um, but although this is good and a lot of academic work is about developing knowledge, hoping that somebody will use it somehow, uh, most valuation studies are not thought or are, are not produced with an a priori understanding or connection 
to specific decision or a specific policy need in this case. Yeah. So this is something that um, that is quite interesting to reflect about. And when we say that science has to produce uh, solutions or help produce solutions or options, uh, this, uh, we are not doing very good with valuation. It seems that academics, when we do valuation, we are not engaging uh, well enough with those who could potentially uh, demand uh, knowledge about value so that they can improve on their decision making. Hmm? Next one, please. <clears throat> Something that uh, it is quite evident from from the uh, from from the literature that we have reviewed, from many many case studies around the world, also is that excluding or ignoring uh, certain local values or marginalizing certain voices usually trigger environmental conflicts. Um, and these conflicts are usually related to value conflicts. So, and I think in every country, in every region, we can think of what kinds of environmental or social environmental conflicts there are, and we can always relate those to a, some kind of value conflict where power asymmetries exist. So what the values assessment has tried to bring to the fore is also a issues around um, social power relations and how by managing those um, usually very asymmetric power relations, we can uh, improve on the way values could be bridged uh, or interests could be bridged between different sectors or between different stakeholders within the same sector. Uh, and this is something that uh, the literature is quite, quite robust in indicating by, that when this is done, like for example, when we establish a protected area, where when we establish a new tax system or a subsidy system to guide consumption in one way or another, or production in one way or another, when we try to bridge the values of different stakeholders, uh, usually uh, those policy instruments are more, much more effective and more robust in the longer term. Next one. Uh, next one, please. And this is too detailed. I just go. So uh, one of the last ideas I would like to, to bring for to have a, a sort of a short discussion if, if we if we can is how can we align all this knowledge about values with future scenarios when there's a lot of academic work about future scenarios so climate change is full of that uh, biodiversity also I mean we are thinking about future scenarios so what kinds of values exist in those future scenarios more explicitly or implicitly so this is something that we need to understand in order to envisage what kind of uh, pathways we could navigate to that ideal of more just and sustainable futures. Next one. Next one, please. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what we have seen from, from the evidence, and we we'll try to portray this in, a, in as clear a way as possible, is that um, one way to uh, deviate from the business as usual which is triggering this uh, socio-ecological crisis is to shift away from short-term material and individualistic values and of course promote more sort of longer term uh, collective understanding of our positionality towards nature and why nature is so important for society and this has to do with uh, what we call sustainability aligned values such as equality, solidarity, etc. And there are, there are others yeah, that the, the literature is quite, quite abundant about. But if we take four examples, four potential pathways to the future um, that are promoted by different, um, I don't know, sectors or policymakers or, or kind of uh, influential individuals or collectives, we can think, at least we have reviewed four of them. One is the green economy. Everybody knows what the green economy is about, creating new jobs, uh, the, uh, uh, creating a kind of a bioeconomic uh, approach to um, for the efficiency of, of scarce resources, uh, recycling, etc., and allow, uh, using payments for ecosystem service, using incentives taxation or green taxation, etc., and a long, long, etc., okay? So we see that uh, that pathway is mostly driven by, by the instrumental notion of values, yeah? uh, not surprisingly. 
But what we see is that there are other pathways, like for example, a pathway that uh, we call as Earth stewardship, which has to do with a more kind of rights-based approach of how people can engage with, with nature. Um, those have to do more with relational values. Uh, there are those kinds of pathways and visions of the future are embedded within a relational value perspective. And if we look at nature protection, it's like almost like the 30 by 30 global biodiversity framework was pushed very much by this idea that we have to protect nature, sometimes because yeah, it, it de delivers ecosystem services, which are good for people. So that connects with the green economy, but also very importantly, a very dominating perspective is the cons a big conservationist approach to conserving biodiversity for its own sake. It's like our moral obligation we can address that as a moral obligation for future generations or whatever, but it's like trying to think that there is some kind of right of nature uh, to, to thrive independent of our desires or our needs. And <clears throat> this, of course, this nature protection uh, pathway, which, as I say, uh, resembles a little bit what the 30 by 30 global biodiversity fr uh, framework is, is, is also about has to do a lot with the intrinsic value perspective. So what here we see that each pathway uh, can have has an underlying specific value uh, promotion. And this, of course, creates tensions between these different positions towards how to envisage the future. Another pathway uh, that is also quite uh, emerging in the literature uh, in different fields is that post-growth or A-growth or D-growth approach. Well, this is a pathway that captures different uh, perspectives from these other three pathways that I've just mentioned. So it's kind of a combination between intrinsic, relational and, and instrumental values. But what we see underneath all those specific values are two main growth values that are shared across those pathways. And it, they are not very surprising, but the literature is quite uh, consistent about it. Uh, there is quite a lot of evidence that regardless of this of these pathways to uh, to envisage the, the future that we want and how, how to get there, uh, what has to be respected and respect is kind of a broad value are biophysical limits, so ecological limits in a way, and intergenerational inter justice. So respect and justice, respect for biophysical limits and justice are uh, two broad values that are extremely important in every discourse, every paradigm that is promoted to, to think about those potential pathways towards the future. And next one, please. <clears throat> uh, one thing that it is also important for us to, to highlight, and I would like to finish with this, is that um, it's not just about embedding values and conducting valuation and embedding values in decision making. It's also changing social structures, uh, institutions, okay, and uh, the social conception of institutions as social structures, the norms, the rules, or the, the, the rules of the game, basically. So uh, the way, so there is, an, there is an interaction between the values that are promoted in society and the institutions that are generated as a result but also the institutions that are uh, in place uh, create some visions or some dominant values and could marginalize other types of values. And I think this interaction is extremely important to, uh, to understand. And this is something that the values assessment has tried to portray throughout all the, all the chapters. Next one. <clears throat> Next one, please. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> And this is my very, very last slide. Um, aligned with this idea that uh, just embedding values in decision making is not going to be enough, so that we do have to engage with inst institutional change or changing of the uh, social structures um, by noting this interaction between the values and, 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 and social structures. What we say here uh, in the values assessment is that values and valuation is part of a, uh, or we can use values and valuation as a lens towards leverage in transformative change. But of course, there's certain types of uh, leverages that are more shallow that will not take us too far in, in this need for transforming societies. If we just assess the externalities that we are generating and we just provide this knowledge, 
but we don't do much about it, we don't embed that information in, in decision making, well, uh, that might even not uh, carry any potential for, for, for real change. The more we start understanding shifts in values with uh, changes in social structures like norms, rules, uh, and norms and rules could do, could uh, maybe could do with how we allocate property rights, how we uh, design uh, taxation systems to deviate consumption patterns from some products to others, and a, and a very large or big etc. Um, so the more we go into into the right hand side of, of um, this leverage point type of graph, the more we will see, the more difficult it will be to to bring the values component into 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 the picture. But the more the more power they will have. So what we call for, or the idea, I mean, we cannot call for in a prescriptive way, but what we say is that the biggest option that we have to really shift from business as usual towards a, that better uh, future that we, we all want is to have a combination of different, of these types of leverage points. It's not just about doing valuation and getting having more knowledge, and for that, our academic system is fantastically geared to generate more and more knowledge, but it's how to engage in changing those structures all the way, even to shifting our perception and our, our visions about what it means to have a good life, what it means to, what progress means, um, and, and these types of, of big, bigger societal discussions. And it's, this is something that uh, the values discussion can also engage with uh, in, a, in a very big way. So I would like to leave it here and you can go to the very last slide to say thank you very much. Uh, I think I've taken my 45 minutes more or less and we don't have a lot of time, but I'm, I'm more than happy to take a few questions. Uh, and if there's no enough time now, uh, engage with any of you uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, you and I, for taking us into the values assessment. And I know it's such a rich material, so well done to make it in such a short time to convey the message. Uh, yes, we have a few minutes, I'd say 10 minutes for questions and answers. So I'd be happy to take any questions and we will make sure that you and I hear them. Yeah. And, and Beata will provide the microphone. I can start just to have it going. And, and you and I, in your, uh, one of the last slides, you, you, there was an error, um, uh, error, the business as usual, that kind of didn't go to the green blue planet we would like to have. So what do you say about business schools as usual? Um, what needs to be changed in, uh, in the way we, we research and educate at business schools? That's a big question. I think we, we could have a whole one hour discussion about this. Um, I am an economist, so I can engage with this discussion about how certain uh, business uh, models uh, understand and engage with this topic. I think there is a variety of business models. Um, so it is very difficult to just have a, a an average or an overall perspective of business and nature and values because there are yeah, so many different models. What I would say is that uh, it is imperative that uh, business models are uh, aware of the different ways we can interpret the values of nature. Uh, is, this is basically just transferring knowledge yeah, to the business sector, first thing. And the business sector, I think, should be very open to, uh, to getting this knowledge and then uh, try to, to think how to apply this knowledge. I think that uh, the, the fact, uh, the overwhelming evidence that the, a lot of, or part, a big reason of the, this existing nature crisis is because of the very materialistic and individualistic approaches to understanding the value of nature is something that the uh, business models can engage with and, and find ways to, uh, to promote um, markets or to promote activities that also relate to relational values, for example. This idea of the sense of place uh, or sense of identity 
And of course, a lot of the branding has to do with that, it's, but it's generating artificially a sense of identity. I think we need to engage genuinely with what are people's real sense of identity associated to a specific place, uh, to how they relate to nature. And uh, through that knowledge, I think business models should be made compatible okay, to uh, respect those, uh, those identities and those relationships with nature and at the same time find ways of, of, of promoting uh, jobs, uh, income generation and so on. So it's like, it's very much into the green economy realm, but, but in a way that is not superficial, it's, it's really genuine and, and that implies, in my, in my sense, is like this kind of participatory approach uh, where um, the business sector really needs to, to have a very close interaction, not only with potential customers, but with society itself. Yeah? So it's looking at society not as customers or consumers, but as something much more complex. And otherwise, yeah, the risk is that um, we will be generating new products, new services and so on, that rather than help the environment or nature, it would jeopardize it. So I don't think this is anything new, but I think that the, the whole values assessment is geared towards this position. But I'm not talking about the uh, finance sector and so on. Again, that's another type of business, uh, banking, insurance, and which all of those could have their own uh, perspective. You know, that we could engage in this conversation in a, in a different way. But I would just let everybody know that IBES is already engaging in a new or is, is, is launching a new assessment which has to do with the risk for business of undermining nature and for the uh, and as well as the responsibility for business to uh, protect nature and I think this is something that I really hope that uh, your faculty or your department will engage head-on with 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 this new uh, IPES report thanks please yeah, uh, Jessica? Thank you. Um, well, actually, I was lucky enough. Uh, okay. <laughs> Can you I hear was, Jessica uh, tonight? lucky enough yeah, yeah, perfectly. Great. Uh, to join uh, the Swedish delegation in the negotiations in, uh, uh, in the summer. Uh, so, and I was very impressed by the work that IPES does. And then I just want to kind of make a parallel to climate change uh, because uh, climate change has been characterized by a good deal of uh, climate skepticism. And I wonder in your role uh, in IPES, do you feel that there is something similar? And then the second question would be that um, climate change characterized by very clear vested interests that have delayed action. Uh, would you think uh, there is something similar as well in the case of biodiversity protection or are the interests more dispersed? Uh, I ask this because we have now this goal of uh, protecting 30% of the planet by 2030, which seems very ambitious. So then the question is, who will oppose it? Mm. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I think it's a great question. Um, it's, it's my personal opinion, not as co-chair of the values assessment, but more as, a, as an academic engaged in these types of debates. My, uh, one of my biggest concerns is that um, not only that there could be some parallel uh, aspects within the climate negotiations and the biodiversity negotiations or delays and, and greenwashing and lots of things that are happening and some very good uh, steps going forward and some steps going backwards. I think this is something that in the, in the international negotiations and even nationally in, in our policies is we can see it in both fronts, in the climate and, and biodiversity. I, I can say two things. One is that I still don't understand why uh, the, the international community, not academics, uh, mostly policymakers, are not uh, pushing for uh, a more integrated perspective on, on, on biodiversity and climate. I mean, there's so much evidence that both have to be tackled together. And the, the steps in this direction are so mild, so small, so uh, there's so much little work being done in practice to, to bring the two together. And the idea of nature-based solution is just uh, something that could help, but something that could also alienate. Uh, so there's a big debate about it. And I think we really need to engage in this interaction between climate and, and biodiversity. If we don't do that, 
we are again wasting our, our capacities to, to move forward in a this indecisive ways. And some the other thing that I I mean I could say more things, but the other thing that I could say very quickly is that my sense is that the climate agenda has uh, of course grown dramatically over the last decade or so in the media, in our universities, everywhere. Uh, I think the biodiversity crisis is equally as important as the as the climate crisis. I mean, in, cert in certain places, could be even more important. But let's leave it as equally important. Uh, not to have this debate about more or less. It's equally important. But what I see is that a lot of the way we are reporting, we are teaching. I mean, there's so much emphasis that it could be crowding out uh, interest on biodiversity. And I think that's something which is which we need to be very mindful about. So I think in our teachings, in, uh, in our universities, when we give examples to students, I think we need to keep track of these two uh, issues, biodiversity and climate, and more issues, yeah? And we could talk about other other environmental, uh, global environmental issues as well. But but the fact that there is a tendency, a natural tendency to, to engage more on climate rather than on biodiversity and so on, might be creating an artificial um, uh, crowding out effect on, on biodiversity science, on biodiversity policy, and for, for lay people are people in the street not to really engage with the biodiversity agenda uh, because for people's minds the environmental problem is climate change. yeah And I think it is a huge environmental problem. but of course it is not the only one. And I think that we need to integrate and at least we need to protect the biodiversity agenda by not artificially promoting all the time the climate agenda. Isn't it? I don't know how we could do this, but I think we need some kind of reflection in, in across sectors and institutions, especially also in academia. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Hi, and thank you for a great presentation. Um, I th Hopefully a short question. Um, I was curious uh, from the assessment and, and then the futures that you that you showed and the, the even the potential leverage points. What are the representations that are used to make these come alive today, to so that they can be understood, translated, go across discipline? Uh, so more than published published works, what kind of representations do we have? So can I, can I ask what you mean by representation? Are you talking about specific, how to engage with specific uh, communities? Uh, yes, indeed. And uh, do we have, well, when, when I think about a future, I think about that we need a representation so that we can understand that future. Um, if we have an assessment, I need to be able to understand an assessment. And, and sometimes that goes beyond text. That can Sorry, I, I your your last part of the of the we question. Utilize. Okay. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear the last part of the section. You got muted, but I, I think if you are talking about representation, like how how we make this to go beyond yet another report. We have so many reports. Okay. Um, this is one of the of the main um, tasks that uh, organizations like IBES. Uh, has to engage with. I mean, IBES has it in its DNA this kind of capacity building as a core mandate. Is how to add capacity to translate this knowledge into different contexts, different needs. Uh, so IBES does that. I'm not so sure about how, in which ways IPCC, for example, does this. But I, I do see, and, and I agree with you that. Um, for these assessments not to just become paper assessments and, and for different sectors, business or different types of communities to, to really engage, we need to promote uh, different types of dialogues and, and, and see what are the capacity needs. Uh, the last chapter of the assessment does a survey of the capacity needs of different sectors from education, business, media, NGOs, etc. So we see what capacity needs and the different types of capacity needs in, that are that are that exist, um, and hopefully, hopefully, someone will will take that message and and start creating the conditions for for this dialogue and this engagement to start happening. 
Uh, and when I say somebody, I hope these are governments, because if governments accepted and uh, endorsed the, what is said in this document, I think they should be responsible as public, and there's a public mandate to protect the public good and, and do something about it. Uh, so, of course, it could be well-intentioned people and, and, and firms and whoever who, who might want to do something, but I think it's in the realm of the responsibility of the public uh, authorities to, to take this. They have approved it and, and, uh, and create the conditions for this representation on the ground. Um, yeah, as an academic, I think this is this is my position, but uh, I wish I could say more. Uh, one of the main representations we have actually done is with uh, local communities and indigenous uh, local, uh, knowledge holders in the values assessment. But for example, we did not have the resources to engage with religious communities and with many other important communities that uh, that could also bring their own positionality into this debate. Uh, so that we, once the report would be accomplished or finished, they would see their uh, themselves reflected in some of the of the of what the report says, and that it would be easier to engage them uh, in in this dialogue. Time's running. Thank you very much, Unai, once again. And um, just a short, maybe final question is that do you see good reasons to be hopeful and to believe that this, uh, the global biodiversity framework is a, Paris, a successful Paris Agreement, so to speak? You can just debate whether the Paris Agreement has been successful or not. Um, I, I've given quite a lot of interviews uh, on the radio and so on about this, and the newspapers and TVs about it. And it's always the same question by the journalists. So I, I get, my metaphor is like uh, the traffic light, I'm not in the red, so I'm not pessimistic. I think this is a very important step forward. I think a lot of things, I mean, we, it could have been an, a horrendous, uh, a very bad agreement or even no agreement. We had a, we, I think we have a pretty good agreement but it, uh, we have to uh, provide content to it. Uh, like on the 30 time, by 30, there was a question about it. We really need to engage in the discussion about how we will accomplish this. What will be the implications of the 30 by 30 for different types of communities, for different types of biodiversity, uh, et cetera. And I think academia here needs to really push the how this dialogue and this debate uh, so that uh, this, this agreement will not just be a paper agreement. Uh, um, so I guess uh, the, the also the responsibility is with us, with, with academics, to push uh, and engage with, with broader society uh, to make sure that, that this 30 by 30 will be meaningful. Uh, and we have very little time. I mean, 2030 is just uh, around the corner. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a big, big challenge. I hope it will not be again a, a failed IG type situation where we didn't fulfill any of the goals or any of the, of the targets. So I really hope it won't be the case, but uh, let's see. Let's, re let's remain hopeful and work for it. Thank you very much. And can we switch to the last the virtual flowers I would like to give you and I? Uh, see if it works. <laughs> It's, it's a signature posture with flowers. If you don't see them, we will send them. In. Thank you very much. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> so you get well, Fran. Thank you very much, Unai. And this is inspiring for the rest of the afternoon that we now will turn into. So, yeah, thanks once again, Unai. And we will go to the workshops now. <laughs>